Hello, and welcome to Practical Law's in-house agenda for October 2017. I'm Sarah Catley, and I'm here with a rundown of the top items that should be on your agenda this month. The item looming largest on almost everyone's agenda is going to be the impending deadline for compliance with the General Data Protection Regulation. So back in April 2016, the European Commission announced that it had agreed text for a new EU-wide data protection legislation and the General Data Protection Regulation was born. Um, there was some uncertainty um, around the EU referendum in the UK about how UK implementation would take place because the GDPR is not due to take effect until May 2018. But the Information Commissioner has given a very strong line on this um, and has very confidently and clearly set out his stall to say that really Brexit or no, UK businesses are going to need to and want to comply with the General Data Protection Regulation, not least because it will facilitate those cross-border data transfers that increasingly make the world go round. So over the summer we've had the Queen's speech and we've introduced the new Data Protection Bill to replace the existing Data Protection Act in the UK and implement GDPR. Um, there seems to be a growing consensus um, that sensible transitional provisions need to be put in place following Brexit um, and real political will to make that happen, which I think will be reassuring for businesses that are working hard at the moment to bring themselves into line so that they can comply. In a recent survey we conducted looking at GDPR compliance though, one of our findings was that 79% of respondents thought that GDPR would necessitate substantial changes in some of their business processes. Um, however, we also found that 13% of respondents hadn't even begun to comply and the deadline for compliance is the 25th of May 2018. So I've given some thought to what I might do if I was one of those 13% and I think there are three kind of baby steps you might take uh, towards correcting that and, and getting on the right course now. Number one um, is remember that you don't have to go it alone. Um, it's a daunting project, um, but one of our core resources um, and one of the most popular things we've published so far is a pro forma board memorandum to secure management buy-in for the resources and support that you need to help your organisation get to compliance in time. Number two, I think one of the things that you can bite off as a fairly standalone task quite early on is considering whether your organisation needs a data protection officer. Um, the great news about that is one of the new multimedia resources that we've got on Practical Law is a video with Richard Merigold of HomeServe. Um, he's data protection officer there and he discusses how you figure out whether you need a data protection officer and how you go about scoping their role. That's a pretty discreet task um, and it will help you to feel that you've sort of started on the road to compliance. The third tip is really for data controllers we published some data processing clauses for use in contracts um, and I would definitely be looking at these to benchmark my uh, data processor supplier agreements just to really get an idea for and a feel for how big the task ahead is and, and what commercial steps I'm going to need to take within the business. For those that are a bit further along in the process and are starting to encounter uh, specific issues relating to their sector um, and want to do a bit of troubleshooting. We've also been working with um, some great in-house teams who have really been at the forefront of thinking in this area in terms of getting their organisations on track for compliance. And so you can really benefit by sharing their experience of how they've tackled and overcome the challenges they've faced. In particular, there's a great case study that we've just published um, by Gemma Witham and Alexander Mead of Tesco, which will be a really useful resource if you happen to be a retailer or in any customer-facing business. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, corporate governance reform, which I think many of us had thought might fall away somewhat after Theresa May's disastrous performance in the general election earlier in the year, actually has, has come back to the fore somewhat. What we saw at the end of August was the publication of Bay's response to the government's green paper. Um, and that response contains a number of proposals. 
aimed at bringing forward some aspects of corporate governance reform through a variety of secondary legislation, guidance, non-binding codes, essentially all of the tools that you would use apart from bringing forward major primary legislation. I think we can take from this that the Prime Minister is keen to ensure that she leaves a legacy that goes beyond whatever the outcome of the final Brexit negotiations. And so those advising companies will need to pay quite a lot of close attention to the developments that might impact their organisations. Instituting kind of cultural change in the business environment um, around corporate governance through a sort of patchwork of different measures can be tremendously challenging for the in-house lawyer. It's very difficult to keep track of the status of various consultations and papers um, and it's also quite difficult to keep on top of those developments that impact your business and those that don't. I've spoken before with Daniel Greenberg about the challenges that in-house lawyers face in this area and the key takeaway that I had from that discussion was to really adopt a laser focus on the particular issues that affect your organisation and be prepared, um, despite wanting to be a good corporate citizen, to put aside those consultations, um, those requests for assistance from industry bodies that don't fit with the needs of your organisation at this specific time in relation to this specific development. So among these corporate governance reforms include some quite headline-grabbing proposals that would require quoted companies to report on the ratio that their CEO's pay uh, bears to that of the general UK workforce. That's going to be challenging for some organisations and I'm sure will be made much of in the media. Um, it's interesting to see, though, that partnered with what feel to me like quite watered down proposals around employee and stakeholder representation. There's nothing formal around that, there's no requirement on companies to do anything other um, than um, accept that it should be part of how you work sustainably as an organisation. Um, so that seems to have fallen off the radar, at least for now. The good news is that despite this slightly patchwork approach, there is an intention to try and bring the legislative proposals together. The current intention is that changes would come into effect sometime in June 2018 and apply for reporting years commencing on or after that date. So in any event, there will be a long lead in time for companies um, on any changes. They look to be largely voluntary and so the main challenge is just dealing with that volume of consultation um, and keeping your focus. Looking more broadly at people's things to do lists, there are a number of changes in intellectual property legislation that come into effect from the 1st of October, including changes in the unjustified threats regime that will take effect from that date. There's a new pre-action protocol in relation to debt claims against individuals, which will include sole traders, so something to look at if your business regularly deals with and has debts accruing from small businesses and individuals who are trading. Many in-house legal teams will still have on their agenda dealing with the fallout from the Employment Tribunal fees decision earlier in the year and figuring out whether they're going to see a major increase in the number of employment tribunal claims back to the levels that they were before the fees were introduced. Also, figuring out whether there are going to be historic claims, so whether they're going to have to deal with a backlog um, of claims that have been effectively in abeyance um, while the fees were thought to be valid. We're likely also to see some news reporting as the case of the two Uber um, workers in the gig economy uh, comes to court. Um, we're not going to get any immediate illumination um, on the question, but I think organisations who have this as part of their business need to be watching quite closely to see how far their arrangements are similar to or differ from the arrangements in place in relation to these workers. And finally, some highlights from across the content that we've been publishing over the last few months. Um, we've had a bit of a focus around content on running a legal department and life in-house. 
and a few that have caught my eye recently have included an article by Brad Duncan of the Carbon Trust on practical communication um, and one by the consultant Ellie Dewan on whether or not you should have an executive coach and finally a piece by Paul Bentel on developing legal teams that comes to us from the Centre for Legal Leadership who we've been partnering on a number of articles and I can thoroughly recommend all of those. Thank you.